Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that it's 2016. Thank you, Lord, because it means it's a year of opportunity. And Lord, this morning I ask that each of us will be listening to you. Not listening to our fears, not listening to our own personal agenda, but Lord, listening to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, let me formally say a proper Happy New Year. That's the last time I'm going to say it. Just, just, when do you stop? Um, I was having this debate on Friday. And it was, oh, it's when you might see that person for the first time in the, in the new year. And some being a bit daft, we said, yeah, what about when you see them about June? <laughs> well, here at Greenford Baptist Church, we tend to have... Uh, yearly or every other year what we call the new motto we've had the new vision statement which is reclaiming ground and restoring hope through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ and you now see what we call the new motto and I put that inverted commas for a reason because it's not really a motto it's a statement of fact um, and it's a statement of fact that I think we need to explore and unpack and it will be a running theme or it has been a running theme already in within what we believe is coming from God in a lot of ways so it's up there it is simply very simply and we'd like to just say it Oh, sorry, I forgot to say. Um, apparently, my understanding is text speak or email, if it's done in straight capitals, you're shouting at someone, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, look, look, you got something. <laughs> and clearly, I'm known for being a quiet, timid kind of person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, can I highly suggest that what we actually do is we say it as it is read? One, two, three. The Lord is a warrior. That's better. I'll leave you for now. I'll let you reserve your voices. It's a statement of fact. It is one facet, one part of the diamond. If you look at a diamond, there's different facets to a nicely cut diamond. And it always gives you a different view of the diamond in various forms. This is one facet of our Lord. At which point you're going to say to me, yes, but Warren, it comes from Exodus 15.3. It therefore is an Old Testament view of God. <laughs> to that idea. <laughs> you can't sit there and say the Old Testament and the New Testament God are two different gods. It's just not possible. You cannot suddenly say, oh, when Jesus came, God changed. No, he did not. In the Old Testament, he's equally the God of love as he is in the New. So therefore then he equally must be a warrior in both the Old and the New. I don't know how you feel as John really led us well uh, this morning. I sat there and thought, oh, you're going through my sermon, thanks. Um, I don't know how you feel about the fact that the word warrior and what that conjures. It's not something that we've not missed. We know that that's part of my ministry and spiritual shape. And therefore then, ergo, I believe not just me, the leadership team and the ministry net team, network have picked up the fact that we believe this is going forward, the shape of Greenford Baptist Church, warrior shaped. But what does warrior mean? Well, because it has all wrong connotations these days. 
We don't like the idea of an aggressive God. We don't like the idea of fighting under the banner, the Lord is a warrior, because that brings connotations of sort of religious extremism. I hasten to add, before you think anything else, there is religious extremism in all religions, including Christianity. There's extremists in all groupings. Just thought I'd mention that in passing. So then it has connotations then of, oh, fighting, killing, taking territory via that way. So we don't like this idea because that sits with us far too aggressively. Good, thank you. Whoever said I like it, thank you. I love it. But there are some that just don't like it. We as Christians are like, oh no. Can't have an aggressive God that I'm following. But then the term aggressive is misused. Aggressive, uh, in our term here, I would say, we then conjure up violence of, of definitely beating people up or domestic violence and things of that nature. That's not sort of the aggressiveness we are talking about. Our God is not that type. But the problem is we've come, especially in the West, a very large juxtaposition with Jesus. We take our view of God through Jesus' eyes. Let's rephrase that. We take our view of God through the Jesus that we have created, not the Jesus of the Bible. Let me give you an idea. I'm not going to put any pictures up there because I haven't produced any. But just think in your mind, if you can, of the pictures of Jesus that you see hanging in galleries. You see on, uh, sometimes even actually on some of our back screens or some of our songs, it really winds me up. But you see some of the pictures up there of Jesus. And, well, what can I say? He's sort of standing there, slightly off kilter. Let's do this for the camera. Slightly off kilter. Half sort of floating with his feet slightly off the ground. Long robe. Beautiful blonde long hair. Looking like a L'Oreal advert. Because he's worth it. Bright blue gorgeous eyes. Sort of half looking not at you. Somewhere vaguely in space. Ah, oh, isn't Jesus lovely? You can imagine that he's had his hair recently blow-dried just for the advert. <laughs> you laugh, but pictorially, that's the image we have of Jesus. That's sometimes the image people take on board. And then when you're reading the Bible, that'll be when it says about love, like God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that it's that love, that warm, gushy feeling of fountains dripping and beautiful tropical plants everywhere. And there's Jesus. We take the love these days and turn it into the sort of hug, warm, forgive, move on, um, cuddle, cuddle, cuddle. So then that translates, I would suggest, into our talking about Jesus to people who aren't Christians or, or just how we walk our daily lives. I've got to show love. I've got to smile inanely at people. I was having a weird dream last night. I don't know if it was the cheese or something of God. I'm not quite sure yet, but I had this sort of pictorial view, and I don't know why. It was in the 70s. I've absolutely not got a clue why. Definitely nothing I was watching last night. But it was in the 70s and, 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 and people of church walking along the streets of London with big grins on their faces going, Jesus loves you. I have no idea where that came from. Why it was in the 70s, I've got no idea. 
But it's that image I see that I think sometimes the church, and I'm not just talking Greenford, portrays Jesus sometimes. But he isn't that. If you're reading the same Bible I am, if you're reading the same Gospels I am, if you've been going through Mark with me as I have been doing, that is not the Jesus I see. Oh, he loves us, but it's not just all about warm and fuzzy and gushy. He's a Jesus who came down and cast out demons, cast out illnesses, actually healed people. He's a person who actually turned around to the society of his day and said, you're wrong. He turned around to his own religious leaders who were completely, absolutely wrapped up in their own culture and their own greed and their own taking and went, you're wrong. He stood and said, this is wrong. But we'll go, ah, oh, Jesus loved. And we'll take it to the point that Jesus was tolerant. And we'll take it to the point that Jesus was so tolerant that we need to be tolerant. So then when we listen in the mail and in the... My old dear, I'm giving my... Um, <coughs> but bent away... In the newspapers, take anyone you want, or on the press, or anything whatsoever, and they start talking about tolerance and intolerance, we start going, oh yeah, we've got to learn not to be intolerant. We've got to be tolerant of people, and, and love people, and, 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 and love them, and take on board their, um, how can I put this, take on board their opinions and respect them. Absolutely respect somebody else's opinion. But we take it too far, I would suggest, now in our society, full stop, and we take on board also actually the opinion itself and say, I'll accept that view. We don't just respect the person, we respect their religious view or non religious view. We're too tolerant. We've got to that stage where we're turning around and saying, yes, oh, oh yes, absolutely, come on in. And, and we'll take on board your view of God. And we'll try and include that. Or your view of the Bible. I don't know about you, but when I walk these streets, in these cars, look at people, and I think, look at the thousands of millions who are lost if we believe the gospel of this book. Yes? If we believe the gospel of this book that says, there is a time coming when judgment will occur. That there will be people going to hell who do not know Jesus. Do, do you believe that? Do you actually believe what's in here? Ooh. Do, do you believe what's in here? Yes. Do you actually read what's in here? Yes. Oh, good. That's all right now. We're on a good... Uh, on a roll. But then you look out there and you think to yourself, all these people that do not know Jesus... How are they going to know Jesus? How's that going to happen? It's just too many. One at a time. But that's only going to happen if we do it. Ah, oh, that's God's job. Guess who he does it through? Let me, uh, let me tell you where this verse came from. 15.3, if you may not know it. It's part of a song. It's part of a song. It's the song, it depends on which version you're looking at. They subtitle it, various things. The song of Moses and Miriam. Or the song of deliverance. 
And they sung it after they had been safely brought out of slavery and brought into freedom through the Red Sea. I will sing to the Lord, it's in uh, Exodus 15 clearly, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and army hurled into the sea. The finest of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. And it goes on. That's not exactly nice language, is it? But this is the point. They took Jesus, um, God took the Israelites through the Red Sea. And you say, oh yes, God did that. And he did. But ah, do you know what happened? This is incredibly important. Just as they're at the edge of the Red Sea and they can see the Egyptians coming towards them, the people go moaning to Moses, not unusual. And then the Lord himself will fight for you, just stay calm. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. Notice what had to happen. God did it, but who had to make the actions occur? Us. Exactly, Dorothy, thank you, us. Moses had to raise his hand up. Now he'd seen tons of miracles go on through him by this point, plagues and announcements, but I must admit, even I probably was stood there and going, you're saying what? Have you seen the size of this water? But it's through us, it's through Moses, when, when Moses acted out, then God did something. Don't sit here whining that the Egyptians are coming. Get up, get moving, and do something about it. I God am telling you what to do, but do something. It's like John's testimony. Is it right to say something because it's going to be on camera? Is that okay? Yeah, I, doubt, I doubt if my parents will see it. You'll never know. But it's about John's testimony about healing. He felt like in his own home, a bit of an idiot. Was that roughly about terms? Yeah? yeah? That's fair. Don't take this the wrong way, John. But, but this concept of healing from a distance, Jesus did it. Why aren't we? He got moving and look what happened. John physically wasn't there. God was. I looked at it and I thought, oh, that's what we'll talk about, healing. Amen. Well done, John. Great testimony. So when we look at our society and we, we sit there and we say, where is God in all of this? Why are people not coming to know Christ? And again, we seem to relinquish something else. Something else has changed in our society. Marriage laws, for instance. Or we whine about the fact that some other religion has all of a sudden got extra ground and people are too scared to challenge them. And we sit here... I would humbly suggest whining about it. Going, oh, and yet, what's the next wave? And what's the next wave? And I feel God is saying, well, get up and get moving. We are not in our evangelism, in our talking about Jesus, aggressive enough. We are not aggressive in our motivation, and I use aggressive in the right term. 
We're not aggressive enough in getting people to know about Jesus and genuinely wanting them to know about Jesus. I'm wondering if, in part of our thing, when I said, do you believe the words that are in here? And you went, yes. yes. Do you believe the miracles that occurred in here in the New Testament? Yes. And do you believe that when Jesus says, I have given, been given all authority and I give it to you in Luke 10? Yes. And you're going, well, where's that in Luke 10? What's it saying in Luke 10? And I hope in my head I've got the right verse. Because I'm going to look really stupid right now. Luke 10, Jesus sends out his disciples. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs in all the towns and the places he visited. With these, uh, to, these were his instructions to, to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the field. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. And it's obviously the usual thing. Don't take this, don't take that, but go on the road. When you enter somebody's house, give them a blessing. If you enter a town, heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. But if a town refuses to welcome you, go into the streets and say, we'll wipe even the dust off our feet. And it went on and on and on. And as we know, they returned back going, even demons obeyed us. And they healed the sick. They cast out demons. People came to know Jesus through the power that was through the Holy Spirit. And if you believe that's in here, then it should be happening here. But I think we've become too soft. We, as I said, there's a facet of God we're missing. It is that. So when 15.3 says the Lord is a warrior and it says Yahweh is his name, I will change that to Jesus is his name. The Lord is a warrior. God's church is his name. Why are we not seeing it? I think there's lack of expectation. I think we're scared. Probably for me, something along the lines of, nah, nah, not me, that's not going to happen. Well, let's look at Moses. Oh, I can't go and speak to Pharaoh. Who gave you your mouth? Look at Gideon. Oh, me? No, I'm too frightened. I'll stay in the wine press, thank you very much. Squelch, 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 no? Not going to join in that one, okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Even in the New Testament, they were not great heroes of, oh, yes. Because they had no idea what they were falling into when he said, come follow me. But you look in the book of Acts, they got on with it. Mark 16. Mark 16. Which I know, I know, I know is not in the earlier manuscripts. And it's one of those you struggle to include in any sermon because it's not in the manuscripts, earlier manuscripts. But at the end, it says, when the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down in place of honour at God's right hand. And the disciples went everywhere and preached and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. Take that summary, put it as a banner over the book of Acts, and there you have it. That is just an excellent summary of what happens in the book of Acts. And this here is available to us today. But I think as Christians, what we have done, we have taken doing good works which are all good, food bank, stuff like that, all brilliant. Getting alongside your neighbour, loving them, being helpful, smiling, being nice. We've done all of that which is good up to a point. When you see in the New Testament there is preaching and proclamation, sorry, there's proclamation and power. 
When you preach the word in the New Testament, it's backed up with power. Something miraculous happens. There's a healing, whatever there is. A word for someone, prophecy, something there's no chance they would have known. And it's scary. But we've taken love just to be giving aid and caring. But surely love is actually releasing someone from something that's holding and pinning them down. Surely love is pulling them out and help getting God to release whatever illness they've got or whatever demon might be holding them back. And yes, demons exist even in England. Actually, we're so blind to it in this country, it's probably more at work, harder, than it is anywhere else. And so we need to take on board that the Lord is a warrior. So when Isaiah 61 talks about, and it was then translated into Luke 4, when, when it's, you know, I've come here to release the captives, open the eyes of the blind, etc. Those two verses are used in both books. And it's the Lord, the warrior, that's saying, I've come to release the captives. He doesn't do and break chains by going, there, there, chain. Come on, come, come off now. Come with me. There's some aggression in it. There's a boldness in it. And I think there needs to be a boldness in us. Well, I don't think, I know. The church has become too placid, too quiet, too loving, gushy, gushy, warmy, warmy, feely, where it needs to start being a voice a lot louder. And by the way, we're the church. We're not the only church. We're church small c. I'm talking church big c as well. But we need to stop being so nice. The Lord is a God is not nice. He is love. Notice the tonal difference. When Jesus came on this earth, it was an aggressive move. It was that's it. Satan has taken far too much ground. I'm coming in. I am dwelling among my people and I will show them how to reclaim the ground that Satan has taken. And I will suggest we need to help, we need to be God's instrument to reclaim the ground that we, the church, have let go. There is too much tolerance. There's not enough stating the truth and the fact and saying, this is it, like it or not. I would love, you have no idea, the struggles over the years I have gone with friends and family I know, and I would love to sit here and say, yes, all roads lead to God. God is so loving, he'll let everybody in. <coughs> but if that's true, then I might as well not bother being a Christian. Scrap the Bible. Actually, scrap every religious book under the sun. Maybe Richard Dawkins is right. There is no God. Well, this is completely useless, isn't it? He's not right. <laughs> Goodness me. But the problem is, I would love all roads to lead to God. But they don't. There is one way, and his name is Jesus. And unless we emphatically state that, my brothers and sisters, and stand that ground and not worry about what the person next to you might think, we might see some ground being retaken. Amen. We are not loud enough anymore. I heard a story recently. Um, 
I'm not giving any details away, but uh, 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 an organised event, a party at somebody's house, next door neighbours come next door, blah, 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 blah. Somebody completely unknown is talking to this next door neighbour, and this next door neighbour went, oh, I didn't know they were Christians. Guess what? Next door neighbour was a Christian as well. Neither of them knew they were Christians. <laughs> Been living together for years. Isn't that scary? Who actually knows, who of your next door neighbours actually knows that you are a Christian, a follower of the living Jesus Christ? I'm a bit obvious, I grant you. <laughs> now, my neighbours can't fail to see the clerical collar. Doesn't mean they see Jesus. It's a big difference. But we need to start being aggressive. The Lord loves them like a warrior does. Wants to reclaim them back. Wants to go in and invade the territory that has got them already. And wants to pull them out. And he does this through his... Don't care what word you use, as long as you know you're referring to yourself. You can say, me! Me! That's the bit. If you notice, none of us actually said me yet. It's like the person next to me. That's okay. Actually, no, that's your problem, Pastor Warren. Tell you a story. I was uh, just prior to Christmas, uh, literally a few days before Christmas Day, I had to go to a town centre. I'm not going to say which one, but I had to go to a town centre uh, to go and get something related to uh, the church. And uh, I was, as you know, Monday to Fridays, not most days, I'm wearing my clerical collar. It's the uniform that God has told me. It's my, for want of a better phrasing, my warrior outfit. Anyway, I'm walking through the centre of this town, and this centre of this town is, is, is one of these big, sprawling, pedestrian-type towns. And as I'm walking down the town, and I'm sort of vaguely in my own world, just mulling on things that need doing, this needs doing, that needs doing, this needs doing, this needs doing, all related to here. All of a sudden, uh, a lady uh, with, uh, who was in a wheelchair suddenly just shouted out, Praise Jesus! And I went, as she's staring at me, right across the... And I went, oh my life. Here we go. At which point I went, I felt God say, and you're going to be preaching on being a warrior, are you? So I shouted out, Amen! In the middle of the uh, Uxbridge High Street. I don't need a microphone, as it's well known. It did ring slightly. At which point I thought, well, I better not ignore it, I better go up and chat. And we start talking. And so we're in the middle, imagine this, in the middle of the town centre, chatting, not exactly quietly, about God, Jesus, about what's going on in her life. Um, she's going through a really hard time, not going into all the details, but it was that sort of conversation. And I sat there initially thinking, oh, this is embarrassing. Everybody's looking. And then I went, oh, you silly what's it? I used other terms of phrase, but... Yeah may not be too polite um, ignore what everybody else is thinking pray for her so there in the middle of the street prayed for her um, was none too quiet about it neither and the whole point of that is not because oh aren't I great because most certainly I am not she thanked me and that was it nothing else happened as far as I know, I saw a bit later on, quite chatting to somebody, quite smiling. She knew, there was nothing wrong, you know, mentally she was fine. She, that she was uh, uh, wheelchair bound. And I sat afterwards and I felt God say to me, that's a warrior church at work. It is not bothered by what the person next door thinks. 
It gets on stepping out, manifesting my presence and my power, and making it happen. Thank you, Dorothy. God never bothered about what people thought. Did he? Did Jesus worry about what people thought? He aggressively took, and it was. I mean, come on, this is the Jesus who made up a whip, whipped out the animals, overturned the tables, and told everybody, get out of this temple, you bunch of evil whatevers. Yes? Is that a passive, smiley, L'Oreal advert? Look, I've just had my hair washed. Jesus. No. So, if we are to be his bride, and we are to be his church, and we are to be his body, are we meant to be all worrying about, look at my hair, which is losing, slowly but surely, but are we all meant to be going, look at my L'Oreal hair, and just want to make sure I'm all done, I'm all right and proper today? Are we meant to go up and go... Hello, Jesus loves you. <laughs> or even just go, hi, all right. And when somebody says to you, what do you do the weekend? Go, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Are we meant to be engaging in the dark powers of this universe and saying to them, do you know something? You've reclaimed the ground in that person far too much. Now is the time for it to stop. Are we? Yes. Thank you, Miriam. She sings the song well. Are we? We're all very quiet now. The idea in engaging in God's work amongst Satan's activity, reclaiming the ground and restoring hope in people's lives seems to be scaring us. Am I wrong? Be honest. It's no good because I've had time, I've had years to process this. It's scary for me today because if you've noticed, I've got absolutely not one set of notes on my lectern. We like the idea that the Lord is a warrior for me personally and for my personal situation. When I'm having trouble at work, trouble at college, the Lord is a warrior. He'll sort it all out for me. Yes? And there are some of you testing me to that. But then, take it to the person in your workplace who needs to know Jesus. And you need to be bold and confident because God works through you. Stretch out your hand, part the waters. Be bold and confident and say, Jesus really wants you to know him. Can I pray for your bad back? Can I pray for that situation? Can I pray for your family member who lives way up north, here and now for them? And doing it in confidence, doing it in the belief that our God actually wants to release people. The Lord is a... What you're hearing from me, and I'm glad to say this has been bounced around for the last six months or so within the team, and it's not I'm the only one, I'm glad to say. This is not just coming from Pastor Warren. This is what we believe is of God. It's the fact that we actually need to be a church who is willing to reclaim the ground and restore the hope. We're willing to sacrifice ourselves as Jesus did on that cross. You know when Jesus said, it is done, on his final breath, ever thought of that as a victory cry? Like a warrior's cry, it is done. The war has been won. Rather, we tend to read it as the, it's done. And he gives up his spirit. would like some thoughts and feelings from you. (coughs) 
I've had enough of talking, basically, for a minute. I like some thoughts and feelings. And it's okay to be honest and real. I'm not really giving you a question. I just want some thoughts and feelings based on what's been said so far. Give you just a few moments. Okay, hands up. Yeah, this, this, this is something I'm grappling with as well. Just, just, because I, just because I stand at the front and I lead worship doesn't mean that I don't grapple with it as well. And it, it, for me, it's coming out in little things at the moment. I, I discovered yesterday, for example, that a football manager that I know quite well is obviously having some issues within his family unit and he was absent from a game yesterday and I saw that some of his players had tweeted that win was for you, boss, blah, blah, blah. And I, know, I know him quite well. So I tweeted immediately on my account and said to him, hello, mate, don't know what it is you're struggling with, um, but my prayers are with you, stay strong. And the Lord said to me, when you, when you tweet, when you communicate, make it clear that you are praying. So I did. He's subsequently not tweeted back, but signified that he's read my tweet and responded to it. When I see him at whatever point, that will lead to a conversation of some sort. When that happens, I'll be ready. Whether that's a small thing or a big thing, I'll be ready. But that's one of the things that I'm realising I need to do through my Twitter account is to communicate properly and not just be Mr. Sports Journalist. I've got to be all of myself and communicate. Yeah. Just on that, just so it all makes it sound like big, grandiose stuff, sometimes it is the small stuff that makes the big stuff. It is the using the language that we use in the church on a Sunday morning actually needs to be used like, I will pray for you. I believe in the power of Jesus Christ. Just those words are very simple. And I do wonder if we think, Ooh. Anybody else? Um, the Lord has, uh, is a warrior, goodness. Um, it's a big thing for me. Where do I start? I shared a testimony here some months ago. Um, but as a spiritual war warfare, I think I shared it with you when you visited me. Um, God was, he took over and he thought that it was a spiritual warfare. It lasted two hours, middle of the night, and it was him in charge. He actually um, manif manifested his power so powerfully. Um, aside of that, I have been going through a major challenge at work for a couple of years. Um, there are some church members here that, that prayed with me and prayed for me over the issue. Um, Jeeps being a very key person, I'm not sure if he's still around. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but the way God fought that battle, goodness, it, it, is, it, it was just God. Um, it had to do with um, my line manager, who happened to be the director of the department, um, and some other members of staff, and it was like going over my head to do things and bypassing me and all that. Um, to cut a long story short, I was due for an upgrade, a promotion. He sidelined me and he gave it to somebody else. And one thing I learned from the whole thing is that sometimes God delays when he's fighting your battle. Um, it might take long, in my experience, it took forever, but he had a plan that became seemingly obvious a few weeks ago when he eliminated the, the, my manager and this other person, um, and I was upgraded to the, one of those positions. Um, and my land manager, I, she, she had a one-to-one -one with me shortly before Christmas. She said, I don't know why I resigned. I have no job to go to, and I said, it's God. Um, it, it was, it was just, it was just, I, I was actually praying to God to, for God to change her mind to minister to her, 
to talk to her to you know to you know to to let her see me as me and not as I don't know what I, I had done um but he, he got sort of decided I don't know why she removed her from that equation I I I, I don't I don't I wanted her to, all to be friends and uh, to have a sort of partnership which we are now having which is already a, a sort of a bit too late and the other person as well but for, for that 18 month period, that battle, the way God hand, I was frustrated, I was upset, I was angry, I was bitter. Um, and Timmy kept encouraging me, prayerfully I was being encouraged. And one thing I knew from, learned from all this is that sometimes delay does not mean denial. Absolutely. And without a test, we can't have a testimony. It might take forever. But God fights the battle. Is the warrior. The Bible says, cast your burden unto Jesus. I cares for you. And also the book of um, Psalm chapter 24. The Lord, he said, the Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. And that I, I kept on sort of reminding. Don't get me on Psalm 24. <laughs> we'll be all day. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. He is indeed the warrior. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, give her a clap. Well, we'll give him coverage, man. I was thinking about fear. I think there are two types of fear, and sometimes as Christians we forget that it is out of fear in God that we grow to know him. But the thing is, if the Lord is our warrior and we believe that, do you know that people will tremble when they see him? He's described in the book of Revelations very well. And if you actually look at that image, if you're going through a battle, he's doing the fight and you don't have to, and all he's asking for us as a church is to stand and stuff. But it's not easy. And it's okay to be afraid because fear of God is where the wisdom comes. So there's a good fear that will enable you to grow, but quite often we're crippled by the fear of what a person thinks. Mm -hmm. uh, false, false evidence appearing real. Amen. If you look at the anagram of that, that's that. Um, I feel, um, basically, I have a friend who's been in a coma for the last three days, and I feel that God's saying that I should not fear to lay my hand on the sick and pray. Excellent. Yeah, do it. You know, I'm fearful in sharing the gospel sometimes. And that's, that's serious. I am sometimes fearful in certain situations. But um, one thing I would say is do not, do not think what you're doing when you share the gospel to one person that you can't see it's not making a difference because we like to see things done quickly don't we and uh, we like things done instantly because we live in a McDonald's society but God works in his time and uh, I've been in contact with people from British Gas recently I know that nine people have come to faith through words shared 30 years ago uh, by myself in that workplace. And uh, that is taking ground. It means digging around for a long period of time and that you are passing the baton on to other people who will dig around again and again and again until that ground is reclaimed. We are part of a body. This church is part of a wider body. As we take ground, we are part of a bigger tapestry of people. Amen. I know others have got your hands up, but we've got less than five minutes, so I need to... So hold those thoughts, because there will be other opportunities, because this, strangely enough, he's not going to go away. Some of you may be well emboldened and yes. Some of you might be sitting there going, no, I don't want any part of this. This is scary. I have to remember something. It's the Lord doing it in his strength through you. Not you doing it in your strength and having to self motivate it like any good army 
You listen to your commanding officer. Yeah? So if you're listening to God like Moses did when God said, Oi, hold up your staff, stretch out your hand, it will happen. And there are times you're going to be doing, God's going to ask us to do things, and you think, well, what happened there then? Nothing happened. Well, then I look like a fool. But it's already been said. We have no idea of the seed that was sown, the plant that is started to grow. Not got a clue. Our role is to do as we're told. Our role is to step out in boldness. The only thing I've got sat in here is that song, I the Lord of sea and sky. I have heard my people cry. My hand will save. And it's like, whom shall I send? The chorus starts with, here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the, I also say the morning in Greenford Baptist Church. If you lead me, God's leading us, I, we, will hold your people. By the way, your people is not the church. It's the people out there who don't know Jesus yet. This song's a great song. It's obviously from Isaiah. It is a response song to God saying, go and speak to the people, and I will confirm it. The tune is absolutely awful because it's here I am oh, no, I'm going to sing here I am Lord it is I Lord please it's here I am Lord I will do it because the power of the living God is in me to make it happen no here I am Lord, Laurie advert, shampoo my hair. It is I, Lord, half floating off the ground. Really? Is that the God that we worship? Is that the God that we follow? No. no. So next time we sing that song, can we rewrite the tune? I have something a bit more aggressive in it. Goodness. The words, I didn't know John was going to choose any of that. That was the point. So when you next time hear God say, well, who's going to go and talk to your work colleague? Who's going to talk to your family member? Who's going to go and talk? And you go, here I am, Lord. <laughs> go, that's fine. As long as you're willing to go, here I am, Lord, and I will step out. I will get moving. Because the Lord is a warrior. And it's a facet of God we need to pick up. He is a holy warrior God. Okay, it is a facet, my brothers and sisters, that we need to take on board and run with. Not just take it on board as a nice little cerebral thing, but actually take it on board and run with it. So when you walk out of here, after you've helped pull down the church decorations, <laughs> when you walk out of here, there's a banner's going to go up outside this inside of this door, and I'm not quite sure, but it's going to be something like, reclaiming ground, go and restore hope. Welcome to the mission field. Or actually another quote, welcome to church. Because church is more out there than it is in... Yeah. Will you please stand? Oh, there is so much in me. I'm, I'm really trying to restrain myself because the problem is I'm sick to death of seeing others reclaim the ground that God should be having. Yes? Amen. Sick 
to death of seeing God being squashed, Jesus being sort of marginalised, seeing his church be marginalised, seeing people having their lives lost because they don't know Jesus, seeing people walking around with their sort of depression or walking around sad and with no hope, that's the phrase I'm looking for, for no hope. Why? Because we are relinquishing the ground. We're being nice. Today is the day to stop being nice. Give you a few moments just to reflect on that. Lord, Heavenly Father, oh, Shabbat, Yahweh, warrior God, ruler of the universe, creator of the universe, creator of us, saviour, I pray for each of us here that we walk out in power and boldness. We walk out, Lord, recognising that our warrior God is with us, ahead of us, behind us, and you are calling us into the battlefield to do battle for people who do not know you, to stand in the gap for them and point them to you, to reclaim the ground, Lord, in their lives to restore the hope in their lives Lord I pray that each of us will know a fresh anointing right now not for self gratification Lord but to be used by you to be commanded by you to attack Satan where it hurts and to reclaim those people who are trapped under his power. Lord, I pray, as it's been a frustration and a prayer for some time now, Lord, that your church here at Greenford will be an example to all others of what it means to be a warrior church. To be one that self-sacrificingly and self-givingly gives of itself to reclaim the ground. To betray the message of Jesus. To give Jesus and to be Jesus in our communities. Through your son Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.